Good evening and welcome to the April 28, 2022 meeting of the Conservation Commission. My name is Tim Hilch, I'm the chair. Meetings normally held at the municipal offices are being held remotely with adequate alternative means of public access and where required public participation provided in, accordant with, in accordance with Governor Baker's June 16, 2021 act extending certain COVID-19 measures adopted during the state of emergency, including an extension of the remote participation provisions of his March 20, 2020 executive order, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, <clears throat> general law chapter 30A, section 20. Um, <clears throat> at this point, I'd like to take a hold of the membership present, uh, Bill Marapisi. Bill Marapisi, aye. Kate Devlin. Kate Devlin, here. Tim Hilchey present, uh, so we have a quorum. Um, and I just want to remind folks that uh, we have meeting guidelines to speak one at a time, follow the Deerfield Code of Conduct, be respectful, courteous, and, and considerate, and be uh, concise and non-repetitive. Um, <clears throat> we will also ask people to be recognized by the chair before they um, start to speak. Uh, we have tonight with us Jay Tillam Tallerman, who's a town council representing us for uh, the continuation of the public hearing later this evening at 7.30. Um, since we have a lot on our plates, I want to try and move kind of expeditiously. Um, and we will introduce John Cocutt, who is uh, representing um, a project near Richardson's Candy Kitchen at, uh, I believe it's 50 Greenfield Road. Yes, hi. Uh, John, could you briefly describe what the project is? And um, while you're doing that, I'll try and call up the, I think you attached a couple of pictures. Yes, I did. Um, the project consists of um, reclaiming, fine grading and repaving approximately uh, 15,000 square feet of the asphalt parking lot and um, removing and replacing some concrete sidewalks and a new handicap ramp. Um, hoping try for the to work to be able to be done um, within the month of June. Sorry, this computer is fighting me. So this is the, the area, is, is everyone able to see the red? Yes. That represents the asphalt, John? Yes. So <clears throat> the reason why you're here before us is because um, on the uh, left side where my cursor is circling, there's a stream that flows underneath uh, Greenfield Road. There's also um, right here, um, a, a couple of um, basins that feed rainwater across the street to the wetland. Um, so what sort of plans do you have for protecting and keeping silt and stuff out of the two water concerns that we have? We proposed uh, just best management practices of putting uh, erosion control around the project and filter baskets in the two uh, mass highway catch basins to catch any uh, runoff or sediment. And um, as far as uh, removal of asphalt and so forth, are you planning to do that as you remove it, put it into trucks? Or are you gonna store it on the site anywhere? Um, we're actually gonna reclaim it in place and use some of the material um, to uh, fine grade and, and prep the base. Um, we will not keep any stockpiles of material on site. Everything will be brought off site um, at the end of each day. So that way we can limit any stockpiles. Um, everything uh, that's reclaimed will be compacted um, in place at the end of the day. Um, especially uh, in the event of any uh, heavy rains so that we can limit any uh, runoff. Um, uh, I'm going to ask if the, any of the commissioners have some questions or 
comments that they'd like to make. Uh, can I start with Bill Mayor PC? Uh, yes, hi, Bill Mayor PC. So, uh, John, I just want to say I'm um, delighted to hear the reclaim word, um, uh, as well as uh, to hear that nothing is going to just stay um, on the property. Uh, those only two comments that I have. Okay, <clears throat> and Kate Devlin. Um, yeah, I, I like the reclamation um, uh, of the materials and it sounds like you've got things in place to prevent seepage into this, the stream across and across the street. Yes, yes. So. Yeah, and depending on uh, uh, approval of this uh, from, the, from the board uh, or the commission that um, we'd like to do the uh, concrete sidewalk uh, removal and replacement first and then to try to really uh, limit the time frame uh, and the overall duration of the uh, reclamation and the repaving anyways, so that we can minimize any impact. Do you have a suggested time frame, like five days or? Um, the sidewalk work could take some time, probably a week overall ahead of the paving project. And the store is going to close the week of the 4th of July. And that's when uh, Kathy was hoping to get the work done. So we're hoping a real short four to five day duration to have this uh, uh, reclaimed, fine graded and repaved. Okay. Um, commissioners, does anyone else have any other questions for um, Mr. Cocott? So Tim, uh, Bill Mayor, PC, uh, I don't have further questions. Um, uh, I, I think um, I just want to be, you know, be clear and have it fairly stated. The erosion control measures would be. Yep. So, <clears throat> yes, I've been thinking about this. So, um, I will try to make a motion that uh, covers both the silt baskets and um, the placement of the erosion controls and uh, forty-eight hour. Um, advance notice of so we can inspect the erosion controls. Um, I think along this water body here probably would be good to have a silt fence and some sort of silt sock or or straw straw bales just to definitely protect the water um, because right. there's already been some silting in this in this from uh, previous storms up above on the hills. Yes. So <clears throat> I'm going to take a pass at this and see if we can do this in one pop. Um, so I move that the commission give a negative determination to uh, because you're not going to be dredging or anything or altering a resource area. And with the following conditions that uh, silt um, socks are installed in the uh, storm drains that are owned by DEP and inspected daily and clean daily and that um, silt fence and a silt sock or, or straw bale be um, totally in, uh, in place uh, around the stream area next to the driveway okay. and that you give 48 hours notice so that we can inspect the erosion controls. Correct. So Tim, Bill Mayor, PC, I'll second that motion. Um, okay, the motion has been made and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, I will call a, a vote. Uh, Bill Mayor, PC. Uh, Bill Mayor, PC, aye. Kate Devlin. Kate Devlin, aye. Tim Hilchey, aye. Motion carries three, zero, zero. Um, all right, well, thank you, Mr. Coca. That was a fairly straightforward project and uh, we'll look forward to a good completion so that Richardson can open again. Yes. All right. All right. All right thank um, you very much. Thank you and uh, have a good evening. You too. Thank you, everyone. All right. So the next um, order of business is a request from uh, 
Eversource and Star Electric. Um, and is there a representative here from? Hi, good evening. Uh, this is Simon Hilt with Eversource Energy. And I also got Brett Trowbridge from BHB, who is our botanist and wetland scientist. Okay, so just so you know, we have we are required to open the next part of the hearing at 7.30 because it's posted. And uh, so we're gonna try to move this expeditiously. I think I think that your your plan is pretty well detailed. Do you wish to share a screen and talk us through? Yes, absolutely. Sure. All right, All right. Uh, I believe um, you can do it. So if, which either one of you wants to call up? Sure. Um, can you see the uh, request cover in front of you? Yes. Great. Uh, again, my name is uh, Brett Trowbridge. I'm a senior ecologist with uh, VHB. Um, and as Simon said, he's, he's uh, available for any questions and will probably support me along the way here. Um, Eversource is uh, proposing uh, rare species habitat management within the right of way line 312. Um, uh, the, the habitat management is not, not for their normal transmission line work, but it's at the request of the um, Division of Fisheries and Wildlife, the, the Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program, uh, to manage for a specific state listed plant uh, in the right of way. Um, and specifically, they've asked us to manage against uh, invasive plants that are encroaching this, the rare species. There are jurisdictional wetland uh, areas on the uh, resource areas on the line, and uh, that's why we're here requesting um, a negative determination to this evening. Um, I'm going to just, if I have time, just walk you through the, the site location and some figures. Um, it's in, in the vicinity of Woman Hill Road uh, and intersects uh, Keats Road twice here. Um, uh, show the aerial image. This red bounded area is uh, the, the treatment area um, extending roughly from the, uh, the rail, railroad here uh, across Keats Road and uh, just beyond a, a drainage on the west side here. Um, like I said, we're, we're trying to manage for uh, rare species, so the site does contain habitat for state listed species. Um, this, this figure shows the, the wetland resource areas uh, within the treatment area. And uh, Eversource is proposing to manage nine invasives that occur throughout the site, again, for the betterment of uh, rare, rare uh, species. And um, the, way, the way we'd like to do that is through the application of herbicides. Um, these are targeted applications, so you know, not broadcast spraying, but um, uh, foliar applications specifically uh, to target species. Um, any taller invasives will be treated basally, that is, they won't be sprayed 10 feet to 12 feet in the air. Um, the, the herbicide selected will be used at the base of the plant, so that will girdle it and, and uh, non-foliar application. Uh, the work's going to be overseen uh, by myself, uh, ecologist at the request of natural heritage, because there's rare plants out there in addition to the invasives they want. Uh, they they, they want to make sure that nothing important is getting hit. And so um, my intent is to serve double duties, uh, make sure there's the rare species are protected, but also wetlands. So um, in terms of wetlands protection, again, we're just doing targeted treatments and um, designated no spray zones within 10 feet of standing water, uh, no spraying within land under water. Um, I'm going to real quick just walk you through the wetland resource areas. Uh, BPWs in the uh, western end, there's a, a couple small BPW areas. There's a emergent marsh kind of towards the cent center of property. Uh, project in between Keats Road and then, uh, excuse me, there's a intermittent uh, stream drainage along the eastern side of Keats Road and um, uh, an unnamed perennial stream near the very eastern terminus of the project, which does project a um, 200 foot riverfront area. 
uh, the, this figure shows again the, um, the resource areas, but also the species that we're hoping to target, as well as their prevalence within jurisdictional areas. I think that's all I have, and hopefully I didn't go over on time. But um, no, that's you... great. Thank you. Um, now I'll open it up to the commissioners to ask you or Simon if they have any questions. Um, Kate. Um, actually, no, I, I don't have any questions at this time. I thought the re the proposal was very thorough. Okay, Bill Mayor PC. <laughs> yes, hi, Bill Mayor PC. Um, uh, so, Brett, I um, uh, thank you for being thorough. And um, just if you could please tell me again, you used uh, the phrase double duty. Um, uh, does that mean that? that you're going to monitor while being there daily? Could you just- Yeah, yeah okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, just jargon. The, um, I typically uh, focus on rare, rare species protection. So uh, Natural Heritage has asked me to uh, focus on that. Um, but because, because there's wetland jurisdiction here and I delineated the wetlands on the property, I would be wearing two hats and that is um, staying with the applicators throughout treatments okay. near uh, throughout the area. Um, so uh, basically when I said double duty, I meant to protect two, two important resources. Okay. Does that make sense? It does, thank you. Um, <clears throat> okay, and this is Tim Hilchey. Um, I basically wanted to say that this is one of the most complete uh, and understandable um, RF, R, RDAs that we've received. Um, so whoever was the author, thank you. Um, I don't have any questions. I think it's very thoroughly described in, in, uh, in what you presented tonight. So I understand that you're looking for a negative determination too, is that correct? Yes, I do. Okay, and if you want to, you could stop screen sharing. Sure. All right, so um, if there are no other comments from the commissioners, um, is there anybody in the, in the public that has a concern or wants to ask a question? Um, hearing none, I would entertain a motion to um, deliver a negative determination to. Hi, Tim, it's Bill Mayor of PC. I I'd make a motion. Um, uh, for the Deerfield Conservation Commission to accept a um, uh, negative number two RDA uh, determination um, for this project. Given, uh, if I could just say, uh, given uh, the proposed the proposal um, as uh, uh, as it stands is is quite uh, substantial and comprehensive. Is there a second? This is Kate, uh, Kate Devlin, I'll second that. All right, the motion's been made and seconded. Um, is there any further discussion? Hearing none, um, I will take a vote. Um, Kate Devlin. Kate Devlin, aye. Bill Mayor PC. Bill Mayor PC, aye. Tim Hilchey, aye. The motion carries three zero zero. Um, all right, gentlemen, uh, thank you for your brief, but uh, succinct uh, description and you will have the paperwork processed uh, in the next few days. Thank you very much. Could I just ask, uh, would you be sending that out by email or via mail? I believe Sue will do both, but okay. we'll do an electronic signing, I believe. So as soon as we get it signed, um, she'll be able to disseminate it to you guys. Excellent, thank you very much for your time. All right, thank have you. a good night. Thank you. All right, so um, we have uh, 12 minutes before the, um, the next continuation of the public hearing. So while we're waiting for that time to approach, I'd like to um, say that we have a couple of requests for comment and I'm gonna have to go looking for them because uh, Unfortunately, they weren't included on here. Um, 
and I don't think we have any minutes to review at this point because uh, I think um, Pete Law hasn't finished drafting them. So um, I think one of the requests for comment, maybe I can ask um, Anne Lee Wolfkull. Did you, the planning board, request a comment from us? Yes, yes, we did for 18. <laughs> 18 Sockbridge Road for the special permit uh, to construct a driveway over 500 feet. Right. And um, yes, request for comment. Um, other than that, um, I understand that the police department and the fire department have been out there. Um, and we, in our orders of condition, specified that uh, they uh, needed to use the, the appropriate materials and um, grading, uh, I think that basically we've approved the project and the notice of intent aspect of it uh, and see no reason why uh, if, if there's a need for a variance, the road exists, uh, the fire department has checked the turnarounds and so forth. And um, so I guess that would be, you know, the, the comment that I would make. Um, anyone else have any thoughts? Hi, Tim. It's Bill Mayor of PC. Um, I would uh, agree and second that comment. I, um, I don't think there's anything further that we could say. Okay. Yeah, so that's definitely. our comment. I'm in agreement too. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, so that was the one that I was thinking was most important. Um, let me see. I'll check my email just to see if there, if I can find the other one. Um, Dixie Graves Road, I believe it is, Tim. Oh, Graves Road. Yeah, let me see. Just gonna quickly dip into my Deerfield email. Pardon me. Here we are. All right, so um, this was a request from uh, Bela Breslau of 60 Graves Street. They are seeking a special permit. I'm assuming it's from the Zoning Board of Appeals. Yes, it is. And um, I, uh, their proposal is to, they're seeking to operate a one bedroom B&B &B in their home. And uh, as far as I can tell, there's nothing of a wetland nature here. so. I would suggest that we don't have a comment um, on this particular matter. Did either of you, um, you, you all receive that information, right? Hey, uh, I received it and I didn't see anything with wetlands either. And there is a public hearing on May 12th. Okay. So the, for the zoning board, but. Okay. Um, Bill, did you have any thoughts or? Uh, Tim, Bill Mayer, PC. So I did receive the information. Um, uh, I, I think at this point, um, um, we don't have a, we don't have a comment. We don't, we don't uh, see um, where it would come before us. Okay. All right. So our comment, uh, our comment on that is no comment. Uh, good. So. Um, I think that's all the business that we can take care of before we uh, start the uh, or continuation of the public hearing. So I'm just gonna check that uh, the representatives are here. Um, I see Mr. McLaughlin is here for, and I see also uh, John Chesia. Um, let's see, um, Kate Bednaz, who's our peer reviewer is here um, and I'm not sure if um, GZA is here yet. Um, and I'd Pro like Tara. to check in also, Tim. Oh, yes, are you guest? 
I, oh, Judith, I see you. This is Judith Rathbone, 131. And I'd also like to introduce Nathaniel Stevens, attorney Nathaniel Stevens. Okay, thank you. Thank Good you. Good evening, everyone. I, I'm not sure if I'm not sure if Matt Schweisberg is available as well. Yes, he is. Matt is logged right. on as well. Great. Okay. And um, could I ask who SD is? I think that's just a resident of South Deerfield who presumably doesn't want to be identified. Yeah. Well, thank you, Judith, for helping me clarify that. Um, all right, and so we will wait until um, the representatives for GZA and Proterra are here. I just wanted to take the few minutes before the official start of the continuation to make sure everybody was <clears throat> able to log in properly. I, I do have a question of fact, um, may I ask? Uh, I would rather that we wait until we open the continuation of the hearing. Thank you. Okay. One of the, Adrian, are you going to be? Adrian, are you going to be the only person for GZA tonight, or will we see Dan Nietzsche? Um, Dan will be joining momentarily. Okay, thank you. So I will take this time to uh, explain how we're gonna try to run the meeting once we open the continuation. <clears throat> I will um, be asking our peer reviewer to briefly summarize um, the report that she prepared for us. Uh, then I will ask GZA to um, give us some of their, their comments. They've had a chance to review this. Uh, then I will um, ask the uh, commissioners to talk with uh, our wetlands uh, peer reviewer and ask any questions that they might have of her report. Um, at that point, um, I will allow public comment. Public comment should be directed through the chair. Um, and so if you have a question, you can put to the, uh, the, to the commission, um, but I'm gonna try to avoid any of the back and forth between peer reviewers and people in the audience. So. Uh, just so you're aware. And we're going to also have comments, try to limit them to two minutes, please. And um, we're also going to try and uh, not be repetitive. So if three different people representing um, a particular opinion start to repeat themselves, then that's not really valuable time spent. So if we could, um, you know, try to cover new ground as we go through, that would be appreciated. So let's see, um, Dan or Adrian, do you know if Proterra intended to appear tonight? My understanding is that they would be. Okay. Um, they may just be joining us. To watch. To watch and they, they may just be logging in now. Um, okay. Well, we have two more minutes, so. Um, and we're prepared to uh, provide responses on their behalf. They they provided us some responses uh, to uh, FWS's uh, comments. Okay, very good. Well, that that probably would be sufficient since we're not we're not in the business of re reviewing the site plan. So, um, all right, I'm gonna give it two more minutes and then we'll start this uh, reopen the continuation of the hearing. And um, Jay is going to just be helping out to make sure that we do everything um, properly. Uh, 
I see that uh, Proterra is just popping in. Okay, it's 7.30, so I would like to welcome everyone to the continuation of the public hearing on the park notice of intent um, application, uh, which we began considering at our last meeting. Uh, my name is Tim Hilch, I'm the chair of the commission. With me is Kate Devlin and Bill Marapisi, who are the other commissioners present this evening. Um, at this point, um, I would like to um, invite Kate Bedness of Freshwater Wetland Services to um, introduce herself and then briefly talk about the peer review that she prepared for us. And over to you, Kate. Hi, everybody. Um, good to see you all tonight. Can everybody hear me okay? Fantastic. Um, so yeah, thank you for the opportunity to, to have a peer review of this um, project. And um, just for the record, uh, Kate Bednow is professional wetland scientist and registered soil scientist with Freshwater Wetland Services. Um, you know, this project uh, and, and going out to the site uh, is very interesting. Uh, the site in general, I think, is, is, is interesting overall. Um, you know, the biggest thought I had out there just to try to bring a big concept into to the review is um, how is the site functioning now? What has the use of the site always been? And kind of thinking about um, with the parameters that restrict the site, which, you know, have pretty well, been pretty well presented so far in the reporting, um, you know, what might be the best use for the site and how does this use fall into that? So um, what is nice about this use and what I had found is that um, you're maintaining most of the area as herbaceous. So um, we're not going in there with buildings. You know, we do have the parking area and the pavilions and things of that nature. Um, but they're, you're keeping the herbaceous nature of the site, which I think is important. Um, and to elevate the site, you know, I find that very interesting and in how that's going to function with the groundwater and uh, managing stormwater as well. So GZA has put together and uh, Proterra have put together a really nice review uh, and presentation uh, for the application. And uh, going out there again, the biggest thing for me when I'm looking at this is stormwater uh, and how that's managed because the groundwater when I was out, um, what day was that? That was on uh, April 11th. And uh, the buds were just barely popping on the trees. So we really didn't have leaf out there. You know, the uptake of the water wasn't quite um, full in terms of evapotranspiration. And the groundwater in a lot of the areas was at or near the surface. So, um, you know, taking that into consideration, I was also out there after uh, it had rained for a couple of days. We had a rainy period at that time. So that should also be considered as well. And just, you know, I think if, if the site is going to be wet, uh, that may be the wettest that we would see the site with being able to infiltrate and, and look into the ground without frozen conditions. Um, so if you like, I can go through my report and my review. Um, do you want me to go through uh, play by play or? Um, I think that's worthwhile. Sure. Okay. So um, just to go through, so this is the April 26, 2022 report. And uh, to go through the information here, we have um, uh, the items that were submitted first on the report and under review, those are items uh, one through five. And then under the document review, um, falling into that next. Uh, the first item is proper management of stormwater is a keystone requirement to maintaining the wetland resource areas, functions, and values. Um, and just to back up, you know, what's also nice about this, this proposal, there's an existing tree line out there. 
and the perimeter tree line overall is going to be maintained. Um, so that's nice. You know, you, well, you do have that wetland in the center, which is more of a uh, farm drainage ditch. You know, this, this, this has been farmed for so many years that the uh, swale that's in the center is, is very clearly was created um, most likely for farming activities. And there's some other swales that are out there, one on the north side of the property, and another one on the south side. And then there's some uh, property lines that run north to south as well, or sorry, um, swales that run north to south as well that are a little bit less developed. So, you know, this property has been highly altered. Um, and all the work is staying out of the wetlands besides that main channel in the center. So, you know, that is, that is a nice thing because that was created uh, by man. So in terms of its disturbance, um, it's kind of in a funky spot and it was created for, for the purpose. So, sorry, going back to the report. Um, so it is recommended that the Deerfield Conservation Commission coordinate stormwater management peer review of the proposed project with the Deerfield Planning Board. So as you can tell, um, there's been a, a lot of back and forth between uh, the wood consultants and Proterra. Uh, so the most recent um, correspondence that they had was April 15th, 2022. Um, where comments had been um, given, Proterra had responded, and uh, Wood had also responded to their comments. And so uh, in my review of that, there's still a couple things that are outstanding. I think it sounds like to work out, and I'm sure GZA can um, have some comments in regards to that. But um, so really just making sure that the stormwater review is complete. You know, that's, I'm not an engineer, um, so that would be outside of my purview and making sure that with this high groundwater and all these really fun uh, hydrology, uh, stormwater hydrology functions that they're putting in there with these rain gardens and we have basins and we have wetland replication and we have fill and we have under drains uh, that are being put in the fill and how do those under drains correspond with um, the flow that we're gonna have in there? Is it really, is it taking any kind of groundwater? So just making sure that all of that is really um, well understood by the commission as part of the review uh, is what that recommendation is. Um, so the design questions uh, presented by qualified individuals. So there's also the reports um, that were submitted by uh, private uh, reviews and um, the one we have here is Chessia Consulting Services LLC. There's two reports that were submitted by them, uh, one directed to planning, uh, one a little bit more directed towards uh, the Conservation Commission and planning. And um, you know, there are some good comments in there. So I assume that that will be reviewed in terms of the stormwater as part of the planning process. And I recommend that the commission uh, hangs out and, and observes the completion of that review and how these comments are answered. Um, I'd be also recommend that the decisions for approval or denial on the project be held until the, the peer review is complete. We kind of just discussed that. And the essential items for the review are include but are not limited to verification of drainage calculations as they relate to groundwater addition, um, conditions and design assumptions. So, um, you know, what's happening out there. I, there is some groundwater monitoring data that's been taken out there. I'm not sure if that's still happening or not. Um, you know, things of that nature, kind of getting that full understanding of, of how the site works um, year round. Uh, evaluation of the potential for downstream impacts to bank stability and flooding potential. So uh, when reading through the stormwater report, it sounds like that's fairly well addressed, um, but really making sure that that specifically is uh, commented on in terms of the bank stability downstream. Bloody Brook is immediately downstream of uh, when the site discharges to the east. So as you're aware, the drainage uh, discharges to the east and to the west. It's kind of a, a split drainage divide. And uh, what's going to the east is entering the uh, stream, which is defined by the bank flags. And then that discharges over to Main Street um, through a couple culverts and then across the street. So. Um, you know, Bloody Brook is something that I know that the commission um, has a lot of uh, concern for as an impaired waterway. And, um, you know, I think this project can potentially make that better um, with having the proper retention, um, treatment, and all of the above for stormwater. 
Uh, again, so reviewing the basin, swales, subdrains, and other underwater stormwater management features. So, you know, there's some storage underground, um, you know, make sure that you have a good understanding of how the design capacity is achieved when we're in the wettest of the seasons. Um, so, you know, where are those in relation to assumed groundwater? And it sounds like, you know, in general, the assumed high groundwater is somewhere around 208 uh, feet per survey. And when you're looking at these, um, wetland basins, wetland construction areas, uh, rain gardens that are for, to the far west of the site, the lowest part of that basin is at 208. But when I was out there, um, you know, less than a month ago now, uh, I was seeing groundwater at or near the surface in that location. So, you know, obviously there is a fluctuation that happens during these spring conditions. Um, one of the items on there was a, uh, Poly on the pond liner is specified in the details for the wetland creation rain garden area, which I was just speaking of. Um, and it seems to state that it's only for the parking area rain garden, but that wasn't entirely clear. It's just make sure that we, we understand um, what the function of that poly liner is. Um, I'd like to kind of get some answers um, and some understanding from GZA on that as it relates to how that's gonna inter interact with groundwater to actually provide those functions and values that wetlands provide when that groundwater table comes up and down and you have that interaction. Hey, um, can I interrupt for a second, Kate? Of course. I just wanted to, Bill, did you have a question that you wanted to before she goes too far along? Uh, thank you, Tim, Bill Mayor of PC. I just wanted to make a request. I'm, I'm hearing a bit of feedback outside of Kate's voice. And if I could just ask, please, if you're not speaking, can you have your, your uh, your voice muted that was all oh yes sorry thank you thank you um so yeah so now um you know kind of just going into that with that polyliner what the functions are and, and really just understanding that in a little bit more detail so you know how that liner interacts um with the intent of that design um also let's see we already talked about that. So we talked about um, yeah. So you know when I was out there with the auger, uh, looking at the site, it is marginal in a lot of areas where the wetland boundary is. So you know we're looking at regulatory requirements of where this wetland boundary is. So when you're generally speaking, when you're um, intercepting uh, signs of hydrology within 12 inches of the soil surface and certain parameters then you're running into uh, hydric soil conditions. Now, um, because the whole site has this, you know, very small, um, there's not a lot of, of grade change out there. And when I was out there, you know, it's a matter of being at just below 12 inches where I'm seeing uh, indicators that would indicate hydric soil. So that's not actually hydric soil because of that depth, but it's just below the depth. And in other areas, there was a little bit more relief between where you saw seasonal high groundwater and um, uh, you know, what would be considered wetland conditions. So I'm um, really taking that into consideration on this site. And I think that, you know, in the design, they've done a good job of that. You know, they're, they're really accounting for this high groundwater conditions. And, the, and it's been very clear that that's what's out there. They're, it's not like it's something that hasn't been planned for. So uh, that's a good thing. Uh, and the limited stormwater hydrology report, there are test pits and monitoring well locations and the data the data is presented in the report. Um, and the test pit holes number one, three, and 10, I wanted to bring to your attention because I was seeing uh, conditions that would qualify as hydric soils. Um, the vegetation, however, has not been evaluated in those areas or the hydrology. I think we could look into that in more detail if, if it was appropriate. Um, there is a determination of applicability that is valid for the site at this time. Uh, that expires, I think it's 827. Uh, 2023. So, um, you know, there's a whole another year and a half uh, kind of before that delineation would expire. And if uh, the commission remembers from a past project that I worked with um, the residents on, there was a determination on a site that we were talking about. And DEP really does not want to do anything to modify any determinations that are valid. I mean, that's the reason you get a determination. So uh, I think legally with the uh, determination maintaining its validity, uh, the legal wetlands are 
um, properly defined on these plans and um, are they legally qualify uh, for this application. But the other thing to consider as well is that by approving this uh, notice of intent or having some type of approval process, you would also be starting that timeline for this wetland delineation again in terms of its validity because it's included as part of this application. Um, moving on to item number three, we talked about this, it maintains the majority of the existing tree light on the site. Uh, on the site. And one of the things I just, uh, it was kind of a curiosity um, and, and part of this area is in the regulated area. There is this fire access road that's located along the northerly portion of the site. Um, and it's inside of the tree line and only the westerly portion of it falls within an area that's regulated by the Conservation Commission, the 100 foot buffer off of the wetlands to the west side. The remainder of that, that road is completely outside of jurisdictional area. But however, when I'm looking at that, I just would like a little better explanation. Uh, it goes right up to the edge of the wetland replication area, which is to the far west. It travels through the tree line um, and that tree line, you know, in, in a perspective that's not related to the commission looks to be very beneficial for screening purposes um, and, and the use out there. There's a nice stand of alders out there. And then when you get to the east side on this road, uh, when I was out there, the ground was not very firm in that location. So I'm just kind of curious how the, the equipment will access that area and, and utilize the whole road. Um, um, number four, so this project is great for getting out educational signage and kind of teaching the public and the kids while they're out there what is going on. I mean, we have wetland restoration areas um, that they're going in and, and restoring, enhancing buffer zones, uh, doing uh, wetland creation, and also doing rain gardens, um, pervious pavements included in this. Uh, we have walking trails that go through wetland resource areas, and we'll also have, uh, you know, if this project does move forward, you have multiple different wetland resource areas that we can kind of uh, have little stopping points and signage points to say, hey, this is what's going on here. We have a rain garden, and this is the purpose of the rain garden, and uh, we mitigated wetlands here, and, you know, uh, why would we do that? And um, you're walking through this forested area. This is a forested wetland. Here's the characteristics and what you may find here and what might be interesting. Um, why do we have pervious pavement? Pavement. So I think uh, it would be nice to highlight along the path because there's literally a path that goes around this um, these playing fields. You know, have little little moments that we can give educational information to the public, and I think that'll go a long way um, in just creating more awareness. Um, uh, I don't believe that this site would be utilized in the winter months, but if it is, I'm just asking for some clarification on that. That's item number six. So will snow plowing be necessary? And are there any de-icing methods that are gonna be needed? Would that need to be, uh, if there's structures there, would it need to be plowed just to maintain emergency access um, to those structures if something was to happen? And if that is the case, where would snow be stockpiled? Um, you know, we don't wanna be pushing snow down into these rain gardens. Um, you know, so maybe there should be a designated area if there's any consideration for needing to plow in the future. Um, item number seven. So this project, as stated in the in the application, will require a stormwater pollution prevention plan. And uh, prior to the start of construction, I recommend that the Conservation Commission be um, given a copy of this document. And also, as part of the SWIP, there is. Um, routine inspections that need to be conducted and reports that need to be prepared and, and stored in the on-site trailer or another area that can be located. And this is a nice report for the commission to get. And this could be something that's put in as a condition of approval if it is um, something that moves forward where the commission can get a copy of these reports so you can kind of stay up to date on what's happening on the site. Um, item number eight, which is, uh, we recommend that the trees and shrubs be additionally planted for mitigation to the north of wetland flag A17B. So there is this um, section here where, am I able to share my screen? I think I can, right? Yeah, I'm gonna go for that. So I'm gonna share my screen right now. Can everybody see the screen? Awesome. So what I'm talking about here is, if you look right here, there's this little, section, if you can see my cursor, that area there um, is like an old access road where it's void of any kind of mature woody vegetation. So my recommendation is to install some plantings along that area 
Um, again, this site with its hydrology, I think the more we can have for vegetation out there that's woody, that's going to want to uptake this, this um, groundwater and utilize it during the growing season would be beneficial. And also it'll help create an extended buffer in that location and, um, you know, be aesthetically pleasing as well. If you're, if, if, you know, shrubs that are put in and trees that are put in that flower, um, produce berries, things of that nature. Item number nine, um, peer, uh, peer, I'm sorry, that's a typo there, peer woods, the peer review letter for, uh, that Wood submitted for 415, item number 36. Uh, we agree with the management of invasive species for the site. Um, and the response to that item there in item number 36 is that the requirements for wetland replication would require ensuring that no invasive species were to overtake the area. However, um, it's my understanding that these wetland creation areas, rain gardens that are um, also being proposed, they would not have that same regulatory requirement for inspection. So my recommendation is that the commission um, add these areas to the um, requirements for invasive species um, monitoring. And this could be done um, for two years is what the recommendation is, because that would just fall within them going out to look at how the replication area is doing and reporting on that. And then if the operation and maintenance plan that needs to be prepared for this project uh, were to include a long-term maintenance plan for invasive species, that's also recommended to keep these areas from getting too uh, filled in and keeping the biodiversity out on the site. Um, we recommend that number 10, the methods for regulatory or um, methods for regulatory guidelines for invasive species control be specified. So generally I'll take the NRCS um, spec sheets for specific species like multiflora rose, um, anything that we might be finding out there, the honeysuckle, um, oriental bittersweet, phragmites, things of that nature, and have that supplied as part of this package so that the person that's out there there's guidelines for how these areas um, and how these certain vegetations would be maintained. I think it would be good to have that kind of a brief synopsis and then have some specific um, guidelines to follow for each different species. Um, the operation maintenance plan for this project, item number 11, uh, be submitted as part of this review. So you can see how this site will be maintained for the long run. I mean, that's really important to a lot of these features functioning properly and for the long, you know, adding fertilizer, things of that nature. Um, and that was something I don't think I mentioned is, you know, even the signage maybe coming into the site that talks about fertilizer application so that no matter who is doing the uh, application of the fertilizer or doing the maintenance out there, you know, it's, it's right there. So if there's a new guy that comes into town and he's charged with going out to take care of spreading the fertilizer, uh, there actually is a sign that's a reminder um, so just in case it's forgotten, because it's really important on this site to try to minimize the fertilizer use. Um, let's see, we talked about this. Uh, so with the planning board, there is a question in front of them in terms of the four inch caliper trees that are required to be planted. Uh, they're asking for a waiver at this time. So in order to have a complete plan set and to have an understanding of what will be installed, um, seeing what the planning board decides on that waiver will then allow the commission to really nail down the um, enhancement plantings to see if more are required. So if you're putting in smaller trees, uh, generally you wanna be putting in a greater density. Um, so if, if it's not gonna be four inch caliper, it's gonna be two and a half instead that are going in. In those cases, instead of having one four inch tree, maybe you would have uh, one two and a half inch tree and a shrub that would be planted or something of that nature, trying to make up for that coverage that you would be losing by the larger vegetation. Uh, and kind of help out compete of invasive species as well, because you're creating more cover, more shade, and less opportunity for these species to uh, proliferate on the site. However, the site's pretty good in terms of uh, the invasives that were, were noted. There was very few. Um, item number 13. Uh, so this was a potential, let me stop sharing my screen. I'm not using it. Um, so the, uh, you know what, you probably want to see my screen for this comment. Let me uh, get to the proper plan here. I'll share it again. 
skeletons. So utility plan. Um, that doesn't show good enough. Um, let me share my screen. The patients. So um, for item number 13, one of the comments that were brought up um, in the Chessia Consulting Services uh, review letter, which is the one for the DEP review letter, is that there are um, point source discharges that they were observing. So I took a look at that. And if you look, these discharge points here are coming, uh, this one here and this one right here, are coming right to the edge. And you know we need a little bit more details to kind of understand how these are gonna melt into the existing uh, swale and, um, you know, they look to be touching on the corner, but without the details to see what's happening, you know, we need to, to make some determinations if, if that is considered a point source discharge. And if so, um, this project would have a different fee calculation, but however, it's fee exempt. So my recommendation would be to just um, modify the fee form, but it doesn't really change the project in any way. But I do think that we need a little bit more detail to know how these discharge points will be uh, constructed as it relates to the bank and um, you know controlling the flows where they leave the pipe and then enter that channel. Um, my some general notes on the plans. Uh, please verify the construction sequence as it relates to the stabilization of wetland creation. Sorry. Uh, as it relates to wetland, uh, sorry, I lost my space. Stabilization of the wetland creation rain garden, specifically as it relates to sea germination, preventing excessive inundation until germination. So, um, my experience is when we, you are creating these rain gardens, um, and depending on how the stormwater is managed, if they are not uh, established with the seed mix and the seed mix has not germinated before a really large flow goes in, the seed will float and you will, the seed can rot. So just having some specifications exactly on a construction sequence. So, you know, before the stormwater is discharging into that, those areas, um, if that area is stabilized first and the seed is germinated, then there's much better chance that that seed has a, a capability to, to complete its full germination process. Um, and, you know, this will be below season high groundwater tables. So this, this um, construction sequence might want to have some discussions about timing um, and when those go in. I would imagine putting them in first thing in the spring or late in the fall would be very difficult. So um, they may need to have some timing associated with that, but um, the applicant can speak to that. Um, the FF, FWS recommends that the applicant detail and submit for review specific project sequencing in the location for temporary stormwater control measures. Um, so with that being said, um, you know, you're, we're going to have fill being brought onto site and when that fill comes in, it's going to change where the stormwater goes. And, um, you know, I think knowing, having the contractor have some general knowledge of where stockpiles are gonna be going, if we have some temporary sedimentation basins, um, you know, we have these rain gardens going in. I, I don't know if this is an appropriate location to have temporary stormwater going because of siltation factors. Um, so, you know, really just having a comment to that so that things will be properly managed and um, kind of laying it out. So there really are no questions on what'll happen during construction. Um, with, with temporary stabilization. So um, that's pretty much all the items of my review letter. Uh, but in general, you know, really nailing down and making sure that the stormwater review is very comprehensive and also relates to the Wellness Protection Act and uh, the associated regulations. And um, I don't know if you guys have any questions. Um. <clears throat> Do you, Bill, Mayor Peace, or Kate Devlin, have any questions? Um, if if not, I want to give GZA a chance to address some of the. They may have some answers that would answer some of the questions we have. So, um, hi Tim, uh, Bill, Mayor of PC. I I agree. I would like GZA to have a chance to. Okay, so um, Adrian Dunk or Daniel Nietzsche, whichever, um, or both. Excellent, thank you. Um, and thank you, Kate, for the thoughtful and thorough review. 
Um, and so GZA and Proterra have worked together to review um, the comments and have some responses. And would the commission, uh, are, they, are there specific responses you'd like us to comment on or would you like us to go one by one through the comments? I think it might be useful just to have you do a quick review of each of the points that you um, want to discuss. Okay, great. Um, so first off, we are planning to request to continue this meeting um, so that the planning board review can be completed. Um, and if there are, you know, any, any changes to the plans from that, the commission would be able to review those changes prior to closing the hearing. Um, all right, and we also will prepare and submit written response to these comments to the commission um, by early next week. So as we go through um, there, the first comment from Kate was about the proper stormwater management. And as she pointed out, um, Proterra is working with uh, Wood to review all of the stormwater management system. And they have uh, come to an agreement on many of the comments and they're working on the last few items. Um, specifically in her question about the, um, the poly liner, it is only proposed under the rain garden feature in the parking island um, due to the seasonal high groundwater and to avoid importing additional fill. Um, the, it may also be used um, under the basketball court, depending on the final decision um, of chamber versus pipes in that stormwater system. Um, but the final placement and liner will be adjusted to be at or above the estimated high ground water. Um, the other BMPs, the stormwater wetlands and the wet swale will be unlined. Um, and then on to the comments about um, the observed soil um, and that in some places that the delineation, you know, that the hydric soils were just below the 12 inches. Um, and, and Kate pointed out that there is a valid determination of applicability on the site. Uh, and so we, we acknowledge that there can be minor anomalies um, with soil tests, but um, as she described, wetlands are delineated from there. There are three criteria. And um, so we feel that the the wetland line, which was approved, um, is reflects the conditions on the site and is valid until 2023, as she stated. Um, now for your question about the fire um, access, that is um, a, going to the east of the, the main entry area. And what is proposed there is that there will be the, um, there's the existing sidewalk, but then there'll be an area of reinforced turf to support the emergency vehicle. Um, and so that's what that additional hashing is going out to the large playing field. And that's just for um, emergency access to get out if somebody was injured. Um, item four. Adrian. Yes. Uh if you just don't mind, so where it comes to a end to the east, how would an emergency vehicle get to that point? Right. So they, the plan is that they would access over the basketball court. They would access over the basketball court and then east along the southern side of the large playing field and behind the bleachers. Thank you. I think I can help answer that too. This is Jesse. Um, there's a hatching on the plan on the north side, and it's similar but not the same to to the um, the uh, emergency access way. Um, the idea on the north side there is that's an existing um, swale that's there, and the intent of that was to have that area. It's a non-jurisdictional area, but it's to have it uh, cleaned out and um, so that it maintains effectiveness um, in, in taking any run on from the north and sending it west as it does now. So I think it's just a, uh, 
The hatching is very similar uh, to the uh, access way to the south, but the, the one along the north there is actually um, an existing drainage swale that's intended to be um, cleaned out. Thank you, Jesse, that, that was helpful. Um, so then Kate's next comment was about the opportunity for educational signage. Um, and we think it'd be a great opportunity, um, but we do leave that to the town departments um, to determine if signage will be provided throughout the park for site awareness and to direct um, you know, lo the local community to all the great things going on at the park. And then the next, the next question was about the details and functions of the wetland. As you pointed out, the existing wetland that will be filled was likely constructed as part of the agricultural um, use of the field. And it has some limited functionality just given its structure and how it's, it's so narrow. Um, so our proposed wetland replacement area is immediately adjacent to the existing BVW and bank. And so that is expected to increase the overall um, wetland habitat in the area, both the quantity and the quality of the habitat. Um, and so those wetlands will provide additional buffering and, and will uptake nutrients and support, you know, retention of stormwater and sediment. Um, and while increasing that habitat um, in the western portion of the site. And we also have proposed um, approximately a 1.8 to one ratio. So there'll be um, about 1500 additional square feet of wetland to provide habitat and, um, and provide for the other interests of the act on the site. Um, the next point was about um, how the park will be used in the winter months. Right now, there's not um, an intention to use it in the winter months. It'll mostly be for spring, summer, and fall. Uh, if the city would like to open the park up for, um, for ice skating or other small events in the winter, um, plowing could be performed such that uh, snow is stockpiled by the basketball courts, uh, which would, which would allow for proper use and continued use of the stormwater system and provide adequate parking for, for smaller events. Um, so not as much parking as is available in the summer, um, but there'd likely be a smaller draw in the winter, so it would be okay. Um, then the next comment on, on the report was about the stormwater pollution prevention plan, the SWIP. Um, and so that will be required to be submitted prior to construction. And um, the, the contractor will finalize that and they, will, they can provide a copy to the Conservation Commission. Um, and they can, will also provide um, reporting to the commission as, as required, that's not a problem. And additionally, um, some erosion control notes have been added to the plans um, from what was initially submitted. So that will provide direction to the contractor on both some temporary and permanent erosion controls at the site. Um, in terms of the next comment from FWS, um, recommending that additional trees be planted in that area kind of between the, the replacement wetland and some of the existing wetland areas, we will certainly consider this and um, we will discuss this opportunity with the landscape architect. Um, and now the next, there's kind of three comments um, about the operation and maintenance plan with the invasive species, um, monitoring and inspections and so, we'll kind of respond to those ones more holistically. Um, we agree that there can be and should be um, invasive species monitoring and management in the rain gardens and stormwater basins. So invasive species monitoring is part of the wetland replication area, but it could be performed um, on these additional rainwater, these stormwater features. 
Um, and so what we're proposing is that uh, for a period of two years, monitoring would be conducted monthly during the growing season. Um, so here that's April 15 to November 1. And during those monitoring events, a qualified individual armed with the NRCS fact sheets about the species and about the species management and identification um, would go out and look for invasive species in these areas. If observed, they would be documented in terms of their density and approximate size. Um, and then they could, the in herbaceous invasive vegetation would be removed by hand, just by hand pulling and woody vegetation would be cut flush to the ground. Um, the intent would be to avoid herbicide use within the stormwater system. Um, and this, this plan in terms of observing early and often to stop an invasion instead of waiting for it to happen and then reacting is in line with the 2004 Massachusetts strategic recommendations for managing invasive plants. Um, so we, we wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, if an invasion did get out of hand, then we would recommend, um, so we, we would consider a large population, you know, 200 square feet or greater. Um, in that case, a licensed herbicide applicator um, would be recommended to be contracted uh, who could treat the invasive species uh, very specifically with herbicide to eliminate um, that invasive population so it doesn't continue to grow. But as we said, our, our intention with that uh, our proposed methodology is for hand pulling, manual removal, and avoidance of herbicide. Um, great. And then the next question was about the planning board. So a waiver was submitted um, for the caliber trees. And so depending on if that waiver is granted or not, um, the revised planting plan um, would be submitted to the commission. Um, all right, and then the next question is about those stormwater discharges that are near the bank resource um, and verifying the details of those as they could be potential point source discharges. And so that is one of the items that Proterra is continuing to work with Wood on um, and to clarify that. Um, and I believe that, that Wood currently has the calculations and other uh, details and mitigation procedures for, for those locations. Um, and then finally, there was questions about the sequencing and the construction sequencing to make sure that the uh, wetland creation and rain garden areas have an opportunity to germinate and stabilize before they are inundated. And um, so this goes to um, during the soil testing, which did occur outside of the seasonal high groundwater season, um, the groundwater was observed to be um, greater than two feet below grade. And so the project is planned to be sequenced so that um, earthwork occurs at the driest time of year in the summer and early fall, and that the wetland replication and stormwater construction would occur early in that process to provide the seed time under drier conditions to stabilize um, prior to seasonal inundation. Um, this area will also be inspected for two years. So um, to, to ensure that the plants have an opportunity to grow and survive and meet the performance criteria that are required. Um, so should remedial planting be required, uh, there is an opportunity to address that during construction and in two years post-construction. Um, and additional construction phasing for the project is outlined within the limited stormwater hydrology report. Um, and so the final sequencing and clarifications to that will be included in the SWIP. Um, and that is prepared by the contractor. So um, further down the process from where we are now, but again, we, the contractor will provide that to the conservation commission for review. Uh, so I know that was a lot. I think we, we responded to each 
each item, but um, let me know if we can clarify anything further for the commission. Adrian, may I just um, ask that, um, did I hear you say that you're actually gonna provide a written response to next week? Yes. Okay, good. So that will be um, a, an opportunity for uh, people to see in writing what we've discussed tonight. So that's a good thing. Um, at this point, I'm gonna ask the commissioners if they have some questions for either Adrian or Kate that they wanna follow up on. Hi, Tim, it's Bill Mayer, PC. Um, I uh, wanted to start with uh, thank you, uh, Adrian and Kate, um, uh, for very comprehensive um, uh, presentation. Um, I think that you know we're I'm learning uh, uh, each at each of these meetings, and um, uh, I don't have any further questions. Kate. Hi, Kate Devlin here. Um, I also appreciate the thoroughness of these reports. Um, I also look forward to seeing the your responses, Adrian, in writing, because that will help me understand more. Uh, it's a lot to take in um, <laughs> verbally. <laughs> um, so, but I, I don't have questions at this time. Um, one question that maybe this is, uh... It's a question of timing and how the construction project goes forward. Tim Hilchey, um, I'm interested in um, how the erosion control plans, obviously you're gonna have to work in all parts of this, this site. So for instance, when you're replicating wetlands, um, presumably the erosion controls are gonna be set up in between the replicated wetlands and some of the working areas. So um, we couldn't use the erosion co controls as an effective limit of work is that correct to say or? I, I think, let me make sure I'm, I'm hearing you right, that there'll, there'll be erosion controls around the active work area, um, mm -hmm. but there'll also be erosion controls around the replication area, which would be outside of other ongoing work of the filling and grading of the turf field. Um, and so the limit of work would be defined by the outermost um, erosion control features, but there may be redundancies or areas that have maybe stacked erosion control to separate out different portions of the work, like the replication and the active work. Good, that's, yeah, that's exactly what I was hinting at, that uh, at different times you're gonna be working at different areas. And so, thank you. Um, you don't mind if I follow up on that? No, please. So, you know, my my experience is that, especially on a project that goes out to bid like this, if the erosion controls are not shown on the plan and specificity of what's going to be required, so, you know, separating these areas during construction, so this phasing factor uh, that comes in, that sometimes it's become can become difficult um, for the bidding process if it's not all shown on there. I've had a lot of contractors go, oh, well, it wasn't on the plan, so I didn't bid it, so I don't need to put it in, it's an extra. So uh, I would just recommend that uh, the plans be very clear on where additional controls are or uh, have some uh, notation on there that clearly describes that additional controls may be required beyond the external um, site controls. Um, and maybe this is a question that Jesse could answer. Um, that's something that um, you're working with the planning board to, you know, finalize what all the erosion control um, maps are based on any changes you might be making in, in the next week or so. Sorry, <clears throat> sorry, I had to unmute there. Yes, that's correct. Um, I'd also just, reminder um done this a long time in a lot of different ways and whenever um kate is correct but when you have a project that's publicly bid um remember we're going to have a whole specification package and what we found is we can certainly direct the um sequence of construction with the plans um, but we also find that a well-written specification 
um, kind of performance based that allows the contractor to um, sequence the work as they bid it, um, but performance wise be able to provide the proper erosion controls um, is very helpful. And that is one of the reasons why um, having the contractors buy in of the SWIP and having them actually you know, have a bid item or it be um, in the uh, in their proposal to provide kind of provides that buying. Um, if we write it and um, you know in its totality, um, sometimes uh, you don't get the, the full contractor buy-in because you know they wish to sequence the work a little bit differently. So we find that um, a combination of a performance spec and providing the uh, locations and the plans and some of these uh, uh, notes to affect about having additional controls at certain points uh, is the most effective. So that's a long answer to your question, but um, that's over the years, that's what we provide um, to be the most effective. And <clears throat> when the contractor is the one that performs the SWIP, um, they usually hire a consultant, you know, during the um, uh, shop drawing review phase and that gets reviewed and that can go to the town. Um, they actually have to file a VPA and, and and they are the ones on the hook for um, you know any issues and maintenance of those. So um, we really think that's the best approach. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll, so at this point, I'm, I'm going to ask uh, Jay Tallerman a, a couple of questions just about process. So uh, in the past, in, in meetings where I've um, seen this, this occur, uh, we try to not have a bunch of back and forth between um, people questioning um, different peer reviewers and contractors. So um, questions are typically directed to the, the chair and the commissioners. And then we interact and say, you know, um, can you address this in your written comments or something? Uh, is that uh, a good way to handle this process? This is the first time I've ever really run something like this. So some of this um, goes to your style as chair. You know, I give open meeting law seminars all the time. I gave one last night to a town we represent and it's kind of a chair's world. So you can be as uh, strict or draconian as you want, or you could be as freewheeling as you want. Where there's a lot of experts involved and crosstalk, especially on Zoom, could be confusing, could be hard to keep track of. I, I do think that there's a lot of merit to confining comments to the chair. And if the commission wants to uh, see follow-up on those, or if GZA wants to provide follow-up because they hear something important, um, or if Kate hears something that she wants to do some follow-up on, then that's fine. But I do think one person at a time working through the chair, especially with in a meeting that is probably more experts and lawyers than commission members and members of the public, uh, probably a little bit more efficient. Okay, so based on that, I think what I'm gonna try to do is strike a balance. Um, I would like to suggest that if there are detailed um, scientific questions that um, experts are going to be posing, that what we try to do is say we're we're interested in this topic, and then ask them to provide a written, um, actionable something that that GZA or Kate could respond to, um, rather than try to discuss all of this in, in this meeting. So um, if that seems like a reasonable thing to do, then I'm going to open this up to um, people in the audience with the understanding that um, if we start spinning out of control, I'm going to press the mute button uh, just to calm people down, <laughs> not to discourage any commentary, because we obviously want everybody to be happy with the outcome of this process. So. Um, who would like to begin? Okay, Mr. Stevens. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can everyone hear me okay? Right, 
Thanks. Again, my name is Nathaniel Stevens. I'm from the law firm of McGregor, Legere, and Stevens in Boston, and I represent with John McLaughlin, Judith Rath Rathbone, who lives uh, is an abutter to this project site. Uh, with me this evening are is Matt Schweisberg, uh, a wetland consultant, and John Chessia, an engineer. And um, actually, when you were just mentioning about submitting comments in writing, we did submit a letter on behalf of Mr. Uh, Schweisberg this afternoon around five o'clock. I just wanted to double check that perhaps you, hopefully you, you received it. Nope, not yet. Not okay. Yet. We did send it to the address on your web page, so it is there. But Matt is here to uh, provide some of the highlights on that this evening. And also John Chessia is also here to uh, remind you of highlights in his letter, some of the things that were not covered in the discussion between uh, the consultants and the applicants, your peer reviewer and the applicants consultant this evening. Before I turn it over to them, just, just a couple of comments. I'd like to remind the commission that the, the uh, filling of wetlands is, is a discretionary permission. You're not, the commission is not required to allow an applicant to fill any BBW. I don't think it's terribly material that about how this wetland, this particular BBW that's proposed to be filled was made. It's now presently functioning as a BBW. The regulations do require that the commission uh, consider the magnitude of the alteration and that they also consider the ex extent of the adverse impacts and how those can be avoided. And we submit that there are ways to avoid the filling of, the, of this wetland. Uh, the applicant has not addressed that in the notice of intent. Um, in, in addition, um, I would just say that, uh, and I think actually before I go into anything uh, else, I think I'll be stepping on John and Matt's toes. So if I could uh, ask that, that you call on either Matt or John in that order. And again, we look, my overall theme, and I think you'll hear that tonight is that, as everyone knows, the application is not complete yet, so it cannot be approved this evening, and we understand that the continuance is being requested, so we're glad to hear that. Yeah. Okay, so um, if no one objects, I'm going to, I had mentioned a two-minute time limit. Obviously, that's not practical uh, for these people to be able to address the points they'd like to, so um, I'd like to start with Matt Schweisberg and, and say, let's try to, try to do like a five or six minute presentation of your main themes. And if uh, afterwards, John Chessie will have a similar amount of time. Um, obviously, I'm not going to be timing this, but uh, and then try to keep your comments to separate topics if possible. So Mr. Schweisberg, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, I'm Matt Schweisberg. I'm a senior professional wetland scientist with Wetland strategy, wetland strategy, excuse me, wetland strategies and solutions. And I just got a question. I didn't realize my video wasn't on, so let me start it. Oh, there we are. Thank you. My apologies. Um, anyway, uh, I'm sorry for the noise in the background. If you hear that. That's my son in the basement in his music room. Um, in any event, um, I won't take a full six minutes. My comments will be fairly brief. I read through most of the documents and they're listed in the letter that was submitted from me today. Um, I have not looked at the peer review report for wetlands because I just received that this afternoon and I did not have a chance to review it. Um, so a few things, um, let's see. For the identification and delineation of wetlands and other resource areas, I well, as far as what I've seen, I think it's insufficient. At the website, um, the notice of intent, that material only included one data form for delineating wetlands. And that was insufficient for being able to determine whether anything was accurate. Um, and that one data point was listed as upland. So it would be great if there was access to all of the data forms for the delineation so that I, and for that matter, others 
could review those and get more comfortable, shall we say, with the delineation and the flagging. Um, and I apologize for this. Can you hear that in the background? I can hear it, but I'm not, others might find it more distressing. It's not bad to me, but okay. um, is anyone else having a I problem? Can take a, if I can take a 20 second break, I'll go and stop that. So pardon me for 20 seconds. Sure. My apologies. Um, so um, with the delineation of wetlands and other resource areas on the site, it would be wonderful if that material was provided to the public, either posted at the website or available upon request. Um, at the moment, from things I've seen with soils mapping and from a review of multiple years of aer aerial photographs, <clears throat> I've seen signatures on aerials that indicate there could be more wetlands at the site. So I think the way to deal with that is just to provide as much information as possible. Uh, I would love to be able to see that. And just for those who don't know me, um, I have been in this business and delineating wetlands for more than 40 years. So I do know a little bit about it. Um, I have been on Ms. Rathbone's property. That's who retained my services. And I have looked into the town's property and seen things that make me suspect that there could be more wetlands. A lot of ponding on the site. It's somewhat of a pit and mound or undulating land surface. And having walked Miss Redbone's property, um, it seems that the town property is pretty similar to that. So again, um, there's a suspicion that there are more wetlands there than shown on the application, um, but, it, but uh, not having been able to get on the property, I can't say anything definitively. <clears throat> Looking at the notice of intent, the application itself, and having reviewed the interests of the act, there are four that come to mind that don't seem to have been evaluated, or at least it's not explained in the notice of intent. And those are protection of groundwater supply, flood control, prevention of pollution, and importantly, protection of wildlife habitat. There ought to be somewhere, maybe it's been submitted, but it's just not available on the website. There should be an evaluation of these four interests and an evaluation of the potential impacts to those interests from the proposed park. In looking at the notice of intent itself, um, and I saw on table two, uh, it said, it talked about uh, work in the bank and performance standards for work within the bank. And it quotes um, that the proposed bank impacts are less than 50 linear feet and less than 10% of the total bank length. Therefore, the Wetland Protection Act regulations do not consider this work to adverse, adversely affect the wildlife habitat functions of the bank. However, when you read the full regulation, both sides of the intermittent stream are supposed to be counted. And therefore, it seems that the impact would be greater than 50 linear feet. Secondly, again, from looking at aerial photographs, multiple years, it appears that 
in other parts of the project or uh, other parts of the site, there are potential intermittent streams on the north uh, property boundary and at least within the property itself. And so again, because I haven't had access to the site uh, or looked at the data forms for the delineation that were done, that's a suspicion I have from what I've been able to look at. In addition to uh, all of that, um, Bloody Brook, which is located directly across Main Street, North Main Street, um, it's a perennial stream. I did a stream stats evaluation and it shows up as a perennial stream. Um, and unless I did calculations incorrectly, a portion of the riverfront area, which is 200 feet wide, extends onto the eastern end of the site. And so I did not see any acknowledgement of that in the materials. Again, maybe it was submitted, but I just haven't seen it. It's not at the website. If it is, then in fact, an evaluation, uh, an alternatives analysis should have been done for this project. Again, I did not see that anywhere. And then in the letter that you received today from me, um, I pose nine questions in there. I won't go through those piece by piece, but some of it has to do with the wetlands issue and uh, some questions about who will be doing what on the site, who will be responsible for what at the site. And in the interest of time, uh, I'm not gonna go through those lists, but uh, that's in the letter that you got today. And I think I'll leave it at that. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schweisberg. And next, we will um, ask Mr. Chessia. <clears throat> Thank you, and good evening. Um, you, you have my letter, so I don't want to go through all the points in there. I just want to make a couple of maybe the major issues as I see them. Um, and one that was actually brought up tonight by um, Kate Bednaz, the uh, depth to groundwater, uh, based on what her or, um, auger tests show the water tables higher than what was reported, which could mean that the drainage systems as proposed could actually be taking the groundwater and discharging it to the surface, which has not been accounted for in any of the calculations. That, I think that's a significant thing to consider where it does go to a channel that is partially on an abutting property and you have no right to necessarily go ahead and do that. Um, the other things, uh, sort of the major issues I think that the commission should look at is in a drainage situation, you want to check the water that flows to each wetland. They have essentially two points. One would be the property line where it drains underneath uh, Judith Rathbone's driveway, and the other would be the ditch that runs along the railroad track. They're filling the ditch in the middle but there's also a ditch that's on the southern property edge or partially within the site there. And that wetland doesn't receive any of the flow. It's gonna be cut off because most of the drainage is collected and discharged the other way. So that's something they should really assess the impacts at the three points, not at just the two. Um, the drainage divides really don't have enough information to qualify where they pick them. And one of the drainage divides goes through the central ditch, which doesn't seem logical because if a ditch was dug to drain it, it doesn't seem likely that the water would come up out of it on the east end. And if you have spot grades to divide, find those divides more accurately, you may find that the calculations overestimate what it currently flows through the drainage ditch along the southerly boundary and through my client's property. There's also um, an underestimation of some of the vo overall volume of runoff uh, from the site. There's water held underneath these systems. We know the water table is high. We know the soils are poor. If you build a wet basin, it's going to stay full up to the pipe going out. And that's not the case in the calculations. And one of the concerns of uh, me and Ms. Uh, 
Rathbone is that if there is an increase in overall volume to this culvert that goes under her property in her driveway, that it could back up and have a more of a flooding situation. In addition, the channel itself is old, there's trees in it. It's not a uniform constant grade or pitch, which it's assumed to flow and it isn't necessarily gonna flow as predicted. If you go out there and look at it, there should be a survey going right up the channel to get the elevations, get cross sections. And this is a real significant issue because it's most of the drainage is directed to this. They have, I think maybe five or six pipes discharging into this channel that is right on the property line, partially on a neighboring property. It's a, something that you really should look at carefully. You know, I know it's a municipal project, but you have to look at it like it's any other project and it's any other property, including if it were your own. What would you be thinking about it if somebody was doing this on a ditch that was right next to your, your property line, on your property line? Um, I think those are sort of the main things without going into a whole bunch of detail, but I think those are significant. I think they need to be addressed um, and we would request that the commission through the chair ask the applicant to look at these and respond to those questions and concerns. Um, the last one I just want to bring up before I stop is that there is a proposal to change the hydrologic soil group by bringing in fill. I, I've never seen that done. I've been doing this for over 35 years. Um, and I don't know that the commission wants to make that type of a determination because what that would re result in is anyone, any project, <laughs> whether you like it or not, would just bring in fill and say, okay, I'm bringing sand in. It's a, now a better soil. I don't think that's what you want to have happen. I don't think that's uh, technically act correct. And in this particular case, these fields are under drained. So it's not like the water's going into the ground. It's going into the pipe. It flows through. And so I, I think that's something that has to be seriously, seriously considered. And that will result in more volume than they've predicted in their calculations. And it'll change a fair bit of the factors. Um, and the rest of it, I think you can look through my letter. And I think there's a number of comments in there that also may require some work. But uh, if you would ask them to respond to them, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Excellent. Um, so the moment, is there any comment from um, either Bill Maripis or Kate Devlin about anything? Or um, I will then open it up to the less technical people. Hi, Tim. It's Bill Maripis. I don't have any comment at this point. Kate Devlin, I don't have any comment at this point. OK. Before I do uh, recognize. Uh, uh, Judith Rathbone, I will say that um, <clears throat> the commission will be asking uh, apologies for not having received uh, your report, Mr. Schweisberg, but I assume that the building administrator was um, home before it arrived. Um, so I'm certain it will be distributed tomorrow and uh, it will go to all of the, the various people involved in the project and, in, and of course the commission. Um, Thank you. And um, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Chair, before um, Ms. Rathbone speaks, can I just uh, ask a, a question? By, by all means, uh, identify yourself and- uh, uh, Attorney John McLaughlin, I'm primarily dealing with the, the planning board side of this, but um, I'm just hoping that maybe at your suggestion that the uh, peer review who's dealing with the stormwater will address the issues that have been raised by our experts. Uh, the peer review tonight specifically referenced that um, our experts should be at least uh, dealt with. And, and we hope that the peer review that's dealing with this critical uh, stormwater issue that you're gonna have to deal with tangentially will do more than just respond only to wood and that there will be some type of response from the peer review uh, to Mr. Chesky and Mr. Schweisberg. Um, if you have any say in that, uh, we would clearly like that to happen. Um, I am going to be filing something in the uh, planning board that will address two issues that are also very uh, pertinent. One is the amount of fill that is coming in and how that relates to the new green site review uh, bylaws and also the applicability of what's known as subsection J. I believe um, the attorney for the board is gonna also address that issue. 
and uh, the limitations of only 40% alteration on the entire site. Um, so th those issues were more like planning board issues. But if both your peer review operator um, uh, expert and the peer review expert for the planning board could specifically address the issues raised here uh, this evening, I think that'd be very helpful um, to get to get their feet on these things. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, um, I believe that all the documentation is being shared, even though the planning board has most of the control of stormwater issues. But I believe all of this information is being shared with everyone involved in the process. So I'll make sure that uh, those those documents are seen by the appropriate people. Um, and now um, we're going to probably move into the two or three minute range for people. So um, Ms. Rathbone. Uh, yes, I, I just like to um, finish um, on a more personal note. I really appreciate the uh, opportunity for um, everyone else to speak. And obviously the, all of these ideas will be more fully developed in written form. And we look forward to the, to the exchange uh, with the um, other experts. And we know that everyone on the commission will follow along. Um, I did wanna say that it's been my family's opinion for many decades that this neighboring land parcel was not developable due to the very narrow entrance and the presence of significant uh, water over the entire property. My father walked it many times. I believe that corn grew there last a long time ago. This opinion that, that we all had was based uh, on my father's discussions with neighbors, with town officials and with scientists. It wasn't just a personal opinion we all had. My father would have purchased the land to conserve it if he had thought it could have been developed. My family had already experienced flooding on the south lawn from the high school uh, field construction of the baseball field many years ago. So we are very familiar with the inability of the soil to handle excess water from development. It remains my opinion. I do not believe the wetland delineation is accurate that there are just some irregularities in measurements because so much of my own land is wetlands. I believe I'm joined in this opinion by many of my neighbors who worry all the time about the flooding that this project is going to create. I measured water at eight inches from the surface on my land last week, not even 30 feet from the monitoring wells. I've listened and read all the documentation I don't think the issues have been addressed adequately to date. I think that the process of bringing in um, additional uh, specialists will uh, make that possible, but I really hope that that is the process that will occur. I think the use of the word inundated is entirely appropriate here in many different contexts. Just as the current frontier football fields have been inundated with water, and the high school has dug ditches on my property line to deal with that excess water in the past month, I believe these fields will as well flood regardless of these theoretical designs. And I think that represents what people think in the neighborhood as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Rathbone. Um... Is there anything else from any of the other uh, attendees? Uh, don't see any hands. So, um, uh, Mr. Stevens, do you have any further comments? Thank you. No, not at this. I guess other just to echo Mr. McLaughlin's request that your your the app you the commission requests that the applicant and its peer reviewers address our experts comments as well thanks and then if this was the second question is more procedural i'm uh, just curious as to what date this matter would be continued to um right so that would be the next thing that we would decide but traditionally we there there uh i believe the next planning board um continuation is on the 19th of may and traditionally we meet on the fourth thursday of every month so we're talking may 26 so in the interim, um, the information that you're asking for 
to be shared. We, we will look at the, the letters that we haven't seen and um, they will be disseminated to GZA, of course, and GZA is working with Proterra and um, Woods, they're all um, communicating together. So um, we'll be in a better position uh, on May 26th to see where, what, what commentary has come out of the, the information that your experts have provided for us. Um, thank you. And thank you, thank you again for the additional time you provided us this evening. We appreciate that. It's always better to let people have their say. And, uh, and it's complicated issues. So we appreciate that uh, you were um, succinct and concise as well. So um, if there's no other comment about this, um, I am following the advice, uh, well, the, the recommendation of GZA and also town council was that um, we should continue this uh, hearing because if anything new develops in the interim between now and when the planning board takes this matter up again, we wouldn't be able to respond to it if we did if we close the hearing. So we don't want that to be the case, at least I don't. So um, I'm gonna ask to, for, to, I'm gonna make a motion that we uh, continue the public hearing on this notice of intent application for the town park until um, May 26. And um, I think we'll set it for 730 again to give us a little time to do some other business beforehand. And, uh, and hi, Tim, second. this is Bill Mayer, PC. I will second that motion. Thank you. This motion has been made and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, um, Kate Devlin. Aye, Kate Devlin. Bill Mayer, PC. Uh, Bill Mayer, PC, aye. Tim Hilchey, aye. So we will continue this uh, on May 26. And anybody who wants to can stay, um, or you can, we have a couple of other small items to deal with, but we won't be discussing this project any longer tonight. Thank you for everyone for your courtesy and concision. And uh, I think it was a productive meeting. Thank you for your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night. Good night, everybody. All right, so let's see. So we've handled the request for comments. We don't have the minutes yet. And um, I believe that there's one final thing that I wanted to um, have us look at. Uh, this was something that uh, we, um, asked uh, Emily Stockman to look in for us. Um, it's relating to the Amy Gazen Schwartz um, letter uh, concerning, I think the location of a, what I'm gonna do is call up a letter and share the screen. So this is, um, this is a letter that, uh, a draft of a letter that Emily Stockman created for us to um, consider and um, possibly send to the owners of the property that uh, this driveway or right of uh, access road is um, affects. So, have you had a chance to look at this bill indicate? And if not, um, I can make it bigger too. Let me do that. Um, Hi, Tim, it's Bill Mayer, PC. Thank you uh, first for zooming it in. Um, and, uh, and Yes, uh, we did receive this uh, prior to the meeting, so um, I did review it. I, I agree with um, with with this being our response. Mm -hmm. um, so, what I propose, since it's we need to make the changes in the open meeting, is that I do some editing. Um, I believe this is. I would. What I propose is if we 
after we discussed this that I put the date of May 3rd on this and have it sent out in certified mail as required. And, um, and then we could put this on the agenda for May 26th unless uh, the gardeners respond and want to suggest a different date. But uh, I think it's, uh, I'm not sure that 7 p.m. would be a good time with, with, this, uh, with the park NOI still out there, but do um, you have any thoughts, Kate? Um, I, did, I did receive it. Uh, and I agree that this would be an appropriate response. Um, I guess it depends what else is on the agenda for the, whether to have it at seven or not. Yeah. Um, I would suggest that uh, it's, it's definitely, if we have to continue the discussion because it butts up against a, 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 the 7.30 time of the next meeting, um, continuation, then we, we just, you know, have to ask them to come back again. Uh, but, uh, it's, uh, I think it, it, delaying is probably not a good idea. Yeah. So, so I'm just going to, and when it's out of a draft, the draft will be, it will be, um, cast as a real letter and then it will be sent by um, Sue and she'll email copies of us to us as well. So I think that's the only thing that needs to be changed other than it needs to be taken out of draft form. So I'll accept the motion to do that. Do you need to put the date and the time down below? Oh yes, that's right, Let, let's do that. Um, and uh, let's see. And I'm going to also see if I can, this information will have to be provided by Sue once the, um, once the next meeting is posted. And um, Okay, and um, so are we, the only other thing that needs to be inserted is the, the Zoom information. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for pointing that out. I neglected to think of that. Uh, and this also goes, to, because there are other people involved, it goes to these other departments. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> all right. So hi, Tim, uh, Bill Mayor of PC. I'd like to make a motion um, uh, to uh, direct the chair uh, of the Conservation Commission to um, uh, edit this letter, uh, adding uh, appropriate dates um, uh, and work with the Town of Deerfield admin to have this letter be sent by certified mail um, and direct the applicants uh, to appear before the commission on May 26, 2022 at 7 p.m. Is there a second? Uh, Kate Devlin, I second that motion. Motion's been made and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, I will um, take a vote. Kate Devlin. Kate Devlin, aye. Bill Mayor PC. Uh, Bill Mayor PC, aye. Tim Hilchey, aye. I'm gonna stop the share. Um, Okay, so I have made the changes and I will uh, ask Sue, to, Sue Brula to uh, take care of this. And I'll um, blind copy you on the communication with her. And um, is there any other business that you wanna bring up at this time? If not, I do have one piece of interesting news. Um, I believe that we'll, um, we'll have an applicant for one of the uh, uh, openings that might will come up on June 30th. His name is Sean Libby. Um, he's a master forester. Uh, he's got a master's in forestry management, and he works for the state depart you know DCR forestry division. So he would uh, 
make a worthy commissioner and uh, walk broaden our areas of expertise because whenever the, the wood cutting uh, proposals come in, I don't, I'm out of my depth. So I think it's gonna be, hopefully his letter will come in soon, but um, he uh, would make a nice addition to the board uh, commission. So if there's nothing else, then I would, uh, we've set the date for the next meeting and I, Yes, Kate. I have a question, Tim. Sure. Uh, Kate Devlin here. Uh, was there anything with the emergency declaration certification? For uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so let me explain what happened. Um, there, we, we did a, an RDA on a pipeline replacement project over on Little Meadow, which is near, um, it's off Old Main Street uh, in Old Deerfield and it's near some of Deerfield Academy's playing fields. Um, the erosion controls from the, the RDA that we did were still in place, but uh, the recent rainfalls created a, a culvert collapsed. And um, so the, the bank above the culvert started to erode and it was about to undermine um, the newly replaced roadway and the erosion controls were starting to fall into a wetland area. So, um, I was called over by uh, the DPW and uh, the police department to inspect. And um, it seemed clear to me that if no action was taken that the road could collapse. So uh, I issued an emergency declaration. And um, so I'm just asking for you folks to ratify the work has begun. And I think they've fixed the culvert and they've installed riprap and um, they're gonna plant over it to stabilize the bank. But uh, so yes, thank you for reminding me. So hi, Tim, uh, it's Bill Mayer of PC. Um, I'm not sure if this is an old hand up, but there is a hand up in the- Yeah, I was wondering if she wants to speak, but I, I, I will recognize her after we finish this business. Okay. Um, so um, Kate, thank you for, for bringing um, that back up. Um, and Tim, thank you for responding. Um, I would like to make a motion to ratify um, an emergency, this emergency declaration. Uh, Kate Devon, I second that. Okay, it's moved, moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, I will do a roll call. Tim Hilchey, aye. Bill Mara, PC. Bill Mara, PC, aye. Kate Devlin. Kate Devlin, aye. Um, uh, Ms. Rathbone, do you, do you actually have a question? I do. Okay. So one, one is a comment, one is a question. The comment is that um, at the last planning board um, meeting, my name came up um, with respect to the trees that had been removed. And I felt that the implication was that I had been sort of um, perhaps foolishly removing trees and reducing my cover. And I felt annoyed that the people who were talking about it didn't know that, of course, I had been through an elaborate communication process with the conservation committee and had had approval for all of that. So I just, if the issue comes up, if I don't know if we're going to reference it in a communication with the town, but I just wanted to say that to you um, all individually because I felt uncomfortable with the implication that I was somehow, you know, removing trees willy nilly because I certainly regretted having to move those trees that were a hazard. Um, the second thing is if, um, it's just a process question, if, if, um, if you are um, elected to the select board through your political campaign, when does that start? And does that mean that you continue as conservation commission chairperson? Um, my intention is um, if I'm elected, which is a, a big if, um, that I would uh, immediately cease to be the chair. I have um, talked with one of the other commissioners about taking over as chair um, and he's more than qualified and that I would remain through the end of my term, which is June 30th, but only to provide a quorum. So um, in other words, if, if the commission needed to conduct business and I was able to provide a third person so that we would have a quorum, then I would provide the quorum. And of course, this is subject to 
what the other two select board members say. So this is just my intent. It's not necessarily what will happen, um, but certainly my intent is not to be serving on multiple boards in town because I don't think that's a good idea. I really appreciate that clarification. Uh, Mr. Mayor PC. Yes, Tim, thank you, Bill Mayor PC. Um, and um, uh, I appreciate um, where, where that's going. I, 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 I do think it's, I think we have to be careful uh, in answering questions within, we're still uh, within a conservation commission meeting here. Um, that's all. Excellent, thank you for that, uh, Bill. Um, so if there's nothing else, um, I would like to make a motion to adjourn the meeting at 9.04 p.m. Um, and Bill Mayor PC, I'll second that motion. Motion's made and seconded. All in favor? Well, Bill Mayor PC. Bill Mayor PC, aye. Kate Devlin. Kate Devlin, aye. Tim Hilchi, aye. Thank you, folks. I really appreciate all your help tonight. Uh, I'm stopping recording.